Today I've come to a quiet corner of Chew Magna to meet Richard Brock. Richard worked for the BBC Natural History Unit for 35 years and produced David Attenborough's Life on Earth and Living Planet. I wondered when did his interest in wildlife begin? Born in Bristol and the family moved to near Exeter, South Devon, lovely part of the world and I was able to go to the sea there which is great near Salcombe and Kingsbridge, beautiful places and so I got interested in wildlife there when I, at a young age um, and then when I went to school in Dorset which I did I was very lucky to have two teachers there one of which was very keen to go down to the coast in Dorset so we used to cycle down to Pool Harbour and then the other uh, teacher was an excellent chap who was very keen on smaller stuff and sort of biology in a broad sense. So in a way there was no stopping me. Once, once I was on that tr track, I was on that track. And um, so when I tried to get to the BBC um, after Cambridge, then th that was a good background, I would say. Was there a particular aspect of the natural world that you were interested in? Or? I would say it was pretty general. But I think it's quite important to try and incorporate some of the smaller animals. And until you know what they are and can look at them and keep them maybe in your house, um, then, you know, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Did you do that? Did you keep animals? Yeah, I did. I did. What, what did you have? What, what well, was Richard Brock's bedroom like? Well, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> but I got so fascinated by some of these particularly foreign small creatures uh, that, you know, that hooked me as well. With a degree in natural sciences and lots of enthusiasm, Richard kept knocking on the door of the NHU in Bristol. It seemed to work because I think they got so fed up with me going to White Ladies Road and saying, oh, I want a job, I want a job. And they said, well, we'll give you a um, temporary job, you know, something like that. And I was effectively a, a, a dog's body. But I got, suddenly, for some reason, asked to go to Television Centre in London, which of course is the headquarters of the BBC, 24,000 people, uh, to see a chap called David Attenborough. Well, he wasn't Sir David Attenborough then. He, he was, in fact, Director of Programmes, which is just like number two after the Director General. How old were you at this point? Well, I suppose I was about 22, 23. And David Attenborough had already appeared on TV. He was. He wasn't as famous as he is now, but he was a national figure. Still. Well, he was, and he, famously, he, he suddenly c came in front of the camera because someone fell ill on a trip. So he was already travelling and seeing amazing animals. And of course, he'd bring these animals back, and you couldn't really do this now, but he would bring the animals back. He would present them in the studio. They usually bit him or jumped away or something, which made it even more interesting. And you as this young, you know, wet behind the ears producer, researcher from Bristol coming up to the, the big smoke to meet one of these top bobs, how did, how did it go? What, well, it, was... it, it went all right. I mean, I didn't know what to expect, but I do remember, well, at that time, I think it's changed now, but the television centre was a big, I think they call it donut shape, but I never know what that means. I would say polo mint shape, circular shape and you walk across this gap in, in the circle and um, this window opened on the sixth floor and it was, it was David. So he said, oh, come on up, come on up. So I went up to the sixth floor, absolutely terrified, and he had two fairly formidable assistants. I don't think you call them secretaries, you call them assistants. And I had to get past them, like, what are you doing here? And so David would open the door of his inner sanctum and say, come on in, come on in. And then he had these maps of Borneo on the desk. He said, look, this is very interesting here. Let's do this, let's do this. And I was saying, well, he knows what to do. He's been on trips. He's, he's the boss of TV, basically, BBC television. Um, anyway, that's how it started. So which series? Was this for a series or for one programme? No, well, it was called Eastwards for Attenborough. And I was, therefore... I don't know what I was. I mean, I was a dog's body plus um, in that I was with him and the crew of five, five of us, on the road for about six months. 
it was quite a big effort really but here was I trying to balance what I knew which was nothing with the great David Attenborough who was very kind he was very kind um, and he in the past his his way of working as you may remember he would just set off with Charles Lagos who was the cameraman and his great friend and they would set off and as soon as they got stuck in the mud in the Land Rover there was a sequence so you know they'd make it up as they went along so I had this idea of trying to make it more structured so each of the six films had a story through it fortunately it was very successful and you know the rest is history well, I got put on to life on Earth, obviously, as my great success on East was with Attenborough. <laughs> I was kind of promoted to um, life on Earth. I was, I was one of the producers. Um, David actually reckons that series was his, his favourite because it was, it was um, a pioneering. It was, um, I love these BBC words like landmark, epic modest words like that but it, it was actually before its time today we're very aware of the issues uh, habitats being destroyed when did you begin to come to notice that and and have concerns about it i don't think it was a particular time i think it was it was cumulative because you know everywhere i was going and people i talked to were noticing this. I think it, later on I become less interested in biology and physiology and behaviour and more about conservation. I mean that crept in of course because when you realise that some of these animals, big or small, anywhere in the world were struggling then I got very concerned about that and you know people have said well you were onto this, I think you've said that um, before Attenborough was. Well, I, I think Attenborough's view was, and you have to agree, that unless people see what these things are, then you can't really start kind of lecturing them and advising them on what should be done because they won't know what you're talking about. On the other hand, a series like uh, Big Cat Diary, um, which was very successful, lots of big animals, and lions and cheetahs and leopards, um, very little said about what their problems might be. The um, Masai Mara in Kenya is a beautiful place, yes, but it's not got fences around it, but it does have a lot of people. So effectively these animals are in a sort of long lead. They're confined. And I th said you can't go on explaining this kind of paradise without explaining it, you know, because if you do, if you ignore it and you mislead the audience, then it'll be up to you. You have to take the blame later for not telling us what was going on. I think what we should be doing is doing better stories, explaining things in a more clever way. And personally, I think the BBC Natural History Unit has gone too far with technology. I think they've forgotten what tells a good story not just amazing pictures. This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. After 35 years, Richard left the BBC and set up the Brock Initiative. This is Planet Crunch. He's produced over 100 short films about the natural world including biodiversity, forests, farming, fishing, shopping, tourism, the media, population, nature and us, money, waste and plastic, energy, water, climate change, conservation and food. And the looming crisis we're all now aware of. You could have just retired. You, you decided to take this step of setting up the, the Brock Initiative and, and the winners and losers films and lots of others that you've done over the years. You obviously felt that was a really important message yeah, well, to, to do. Two or three things there. One, one is I was very kindly, and this is not true for many people, I was left quite a lot of money by my mother and my sister. And I thought, well, you know, what else am I going to do with this? Very, ni <laughs> very nice to be given a lot of money like that. 
So I thought, well, uh, what I want to do, because I like doing it, is making films with a, you know, for a reason, with a, me with a message. So I decided to do that by, as you say, doing these, uh, all these films and then eventually the book. So the book, well, and the films are a sort of legacy. Yeah, it's called Planet Crunch. This is a dummy copy. Yes, the backside, but no insult to anyone called Dave, but it's two dung beetles saying to each other, a bigger job than usual, Dave. And here's a large elephant. And here's some tick birds. So there's a slight hint of ecology. There's, there's some fun in it, but there's also some, something quite serious. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's wildlife slanted. Because one of the things, you know, it's got 19 chapters and it goes across oil, nature, supermarkets, food, um, media. So what it's trying to do, which I, don't, I haven't seen in any other books, and there have been quite a lot of other books of this sort, which are mainly about climate change, uh, is to bring in biodiversity and show that in all these different ways, in these 19 chapters, we are connected. Since his BBC days, Richard has lived right on the banks of the River Chew. Try and sum up your feelings about the Chew Valley as a place. What, what, what do you like? I, th I think what's remarkable about it, and I don't know how it's been achieved, is that we are 10 miles from one of the country's biggest cities, Bristol. We are kind of protected from it by the uh, by Dundry, th those hills. And if you come up out of Bristol <coughs> towards to to Magna, you, 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 what you can notice is that there's a, the, the houses on that side, on the Bristol side, end in a more or less straight line. And then when you got over the top of Dundry, then you see the lake and empty countryside. Well, it's not empty because it's got villages in it, but it's quite remarkable. And I remember when I was working really hard in the, in the BBC, the, the relief coming over the hill at Dundry to see that countryside uh, was great. It was really lovely, very lucky. Yeah. But also, the, there is this greenness in, in, again, it's a rather special village, but it has a green side to it, doesn't it? They're rewilding now in the churchyard, and uh, that's, a, that's a whole movement. If each community cherishes nature more surely that's a good thing yes and i think that's happened um because of the pandemic i mean that is what people say but as i've said i worry slightly that we'll if you like drift or be tempted back into the what i call bad old days what people call normal but normal was the problem normal we were addicted to flying planes for a weekend you know the planet can't take it we need two or three more planets to provide the resources that we often don't actually need isn't the truth that we're all very comfortable and the trouble is we don't want to stop being so comfortable no we, we are addicted to that lifestyle and to do to detach ourselves is 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 uncomfortable and of course working against this if you like in opposition are the advertisers and the businesses people want jobs quite understand that so you move really from quite a small problem like saving some rare bird on an island in the pacific to saving a blue spot in the universe which is us and there's no other blue spot for decades now you've been saying to people we've got to we've got to stop ruining habitats we've got to look after not just the animals the whole ecosystem everything every part of the system is important but the truth is we haven't changed what has caused the problem no we're still making noise about it and and politically i'm not a politician type person really but you know they're not going to change anything drastically when they still want to stay in power with with Boris Johnson. I mean, he was saying, spend, spend, spend. So, you know, what are we going to do with all this stuff? So you've got to make it politically 
acceptable to reuse clothes. Don't worry that you're using the same dress the next day or next year or whenever it is. Make that a plus. But you've got to get that into people's brains because at the moment they're addicted to buying, you know, a new bit of clothing this week or next week. And then if they don't like it, they send it back. Where's this food coming from? What happens to it? You know, most of it's wasted. It's rotting in the fridge. Now, what you've got to do is form a movement, however it's expressed, saying, well, actually, we, we, we shouldn't throw that away. That's perfectly good food. Um, you know, I just remember thinking when I was in Kenya, this woman, um, and one of her most valued items was um, a glass coffee pot. You know, what, what Nescafe comes in. You know, a jar. Jar, jar, right, a jar. And that was always with her. She had that because she could use it for so many things. It was transparent, it had a lid on it. it, it was quite strong, and she just carried it around. Now we just chuck something out in the bin, don't we? So the perspective, just taking that one example, is so totally different. And then you have crazy people trying to send rockets to, the, to Mars, that sort of money. Well, it's absolutely no use to anybody, Mars. Do you know what they said? <laughs> when I put in the book, I said, hold the front page, hold the front page. On Mars, they found some mud. Then they saw some wind. I don't know if they saw it. Then they saw the tracks of the rover that was roving around, messing up another planet, which we would surely do. Why, why doesn't someone stand up? I never saw anybody criticising, because this is like playing it against. Well, we've always been born to explore. You know, we never have got to America if we hadn't wanted to explore. Look at all the daring things we've done, all the things we've found, like penicillin and mm. um, clever things like that, and mobile phones, whatever you know. I think you're right. I think the excitement should be of someone who's perfecting new technologies which allow us to be not relying on the natural world as we've done in the past because it's all this the mining the you know which continues mining is a very good example because i mean david was talking about this quite a while ago um and now they've found these um these these pieces of rare metals you could see there's a global row coming up probably with china because they have a big supply of that so what you're now getting, these meetings and conferences, which don't often go anywhere, deciding whether to attack the sea floor. Well, what right have we got to do that? Well, then you say, well, you can't have a mobile phone then. There's a major international conference end of this year, which was postponed because of COVID. The, the, Cop the COP26. COP26. How, yeah. that, how do, you, do you see hope there? I mean, it's, at I, least it's going to be the subject that they're talking about is saving the planet. Yeah, well, it'll be a lot of hot air, global warming, as they call it. Very broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, if the green flavour, the green emphasis, get it does get to the front page and feeds through to everything that happens, now that is a very grand idea that everything we do is costed, really, to the planet. If you can turn it round or take it that far, there is a chance. But my worry is that it won't happen at COP26 because there are too many people with too many agendas. We just have to agree to live less greedily. Greed is a basic human problem, I think, and it's encouraged by huge commercial and political demands, really, demands that we do, we respond to. You say this is a legacy, you, you, all your videos, your book. This is, now for, for anyone watching this, what would be your, your parting thought to leave them with? What we're saying, we're saying quite urgently now, David Attenborough saying it urgently, is we've got, to f we've got to fix this, it's nearly too late. But we seem incapable of doing that. Someone with a biological, behavioural outlook would be able to, from the moon if you like, that detached, well, you, 
look at us as a biological system and say, well, look, these guys are going down the wrong line. You know, they're fighting each other, they're running out of resources, they're polluting the place. Um, they've got it wrong. I think it's a question of time. It's, it's a race against time. It's also a race against our own f fabric of society, which drives us to need more, drives us to produce more children. Those children want more stuff. The planet doesn't have that stuff. So when you've run out of stuff, you've run out of planet. COP26 in Glasgow in uh, November is a chance, some would say the last chance, to sort the planet out. Now how it's enforced, how it's measured, that takes more conferences, that takes more paperwork, and that delays the result. So that's why I'm not hopeful, to be honest. I think things are moving better, but I don't think they're going to move enough in the time we've got, really. And I think it's really sad to know that such a small percentage of wild places and wild species, you know, still exist, are still allowed to exist when we go marching on. For details of how to get a free copy of the book or watch any of Richard's films, visit brockinitiative.org.